So I want to talk a little bit about supportive care. Um, what are some of the biggest gaps you see in supportive care that need to be addressed kind of to move forward in um, survivorship? So I think um, supportive care, survivorship is one of the um, hardest kind of unmet needs when it comes to taking care of patients with cancer. I think we do a great job in discussing, hey, um, this is the best best medication to, to have sustained MRD. This is the best medication um, in terms of overall survival and performance status. But it's it's hard when we talk about the balance between quality of life and the long-term effects that some of these medications can have on patients. And, you know, we're talking about the heart failure that may develop the, the significant neuropathy that is um, developing uh, with some of the medications that we're using. Um, that, to me, is one of the hardest things. One, you, you, you win. Hey, it's a cancer win, right? But then you are, are miserable um, in the long term. And so trying to uh, balance the two. I think a lot of the studies that when we're conducting them, they're doing lots of research on the adverse events and the side effect profile. And, and the, the goal is how we, can we have such a, a great responding drug, but minimize some of those AEs that develop. So I'm curious, when a patient does hit this kind of ideal outcome from treatment, what is the typical cadence of follow-up? What should people expect? And what are some of the factors that impact that? So it really depends on your patient, right? And you have your more compliant patients and your less compliant patients. And that less compliant patient, they're going to see me pretty pretty frequently. So I have a patient that is seeing me definitely once a month uh, regularly because I know that they're not following up. They're not even taking their medications. Um, for instance, your your Revlimid is, is oral. And so and many of the patients are able to take those at home and you can follow them a little bit less frequently. I think with the use of the quadruplet therapies, a lot of them are still being uh, administered in the office. And so you still get to lay an eye on your, your patient. So I think it it's going to change, but it really depends on the patients you have to, to be a little bit more tuned to. Mm -hmm. Are there any factors like in, in patients' lives that impact their, their follow-up? ability and how does that impact their prognosis moving forward? Are people kind of regressing a little bit or for the most part, are they able to kind of hold steady in this ideal state? So I think socioeconomics plays a major part and in, in not just, you know, the overall prognosis, but really how they're adhering and being compliant to the, to the treatment. Um, you know, you, you always hear of uh, a husband does better if he has a wife, you know, when it comes to, to medicine. And I think it's, it's true because, you know, you have some form of a, a family member, a daughter, a sister, um, who is making sure that that patient is actually coming to the office and receiving their, their treatment. Um, those who are by themselves, who don't really have that support, I think we, we know, um, and you don't need the data on that. You know that those patients are not doing as well. Um, you have to make sure that they have access to the care, that they have transportation. Um, I think when we when we think about just not even being in the city or going to academic centers, uh, many of the ac academic institutions you have to drive, and then you have to pay for the parking. Um, you're, it's a, it's really difficult for them, but for those patients to actually receive the care, and so all those things kind of play a, a major role in and um, their treatment.